Hello, everyone. Sorry for being a few minutes late. <coughs> yes, well, we won't hold it against you your first day on the job. And are you going to let me speak before we get into grilling me, Matt, or are you going to just jump right into the well, holding me accountable like part? <coughs> Understand. Uh, let me start with a few uh, brief remarks before we turn to your uh, questions. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm uh, recovering from a little bit of a cold. So, uh, The Secretary is on his way back from a successful trip to Japan and Papua New Guinea, where we continued work revitalizing and strengthening alliances around the world. Thanks to our shared efforts, the G7 is now stronger and more united than ever on our shared goals. First, we made clear that we are united on the core elements that underpin our common approach to China. We stand together as partners on a set of core shared principles. Second, we are deepening our cooperation on economic security and resilience, which includes strengthening and diversifying supply chains, launching a new coordination platform to help deter and counter economic coercion, and affirming the need to protect emerging technologies. Third, we reaffirmed our commitment to addressing global challenges, including the climate crisis. We launched a Clean Energy Action Plan, which underscores the need for investment and incentives to build a clean energy economy of the future and create jobs at home and around the world. <clears throat> we made clear we will continue to support the people of Ukraine as they defend themselves against Russia's invasion. In coordination with the G7, Australia and other partners, we impose new sanctions to further degrade Russia's military and deny Russia resources to fuel its continued aggression and abuses against the people of Ukraine. The sanctions hit over 200 entities, individuals, vessels, and aircraft. Finally, President Biden announced our 38th tranche of security assistance for Ukraine's courageous def defenders, including fourth generation fighter aircraft training. We are honoring our commitment to stand with Ukraine as long as it takes. We welcome and support Ukraine's commitment to a just peace based on fundamental principles enshrined in the United Nations Charter. And then let me just close by saying, earlier today, while in Papua New Guinea, Secretary Blinken reaffirmed our continued commitment to the Indo-Pacific and affirmed a vision of cooperation and partnership to address shared challenges, bolster Pacific regionalism, advance economic growth and sustainable development, maintain peace and security in the region, and expand opportunities for our people. And with that, before I go to Matt, let me just say uh, a few personal comments, and that's that it is uh, both an honor and a privilege for me to stand here before you uh, to speak to you and to the American people about the work that the men and women in this department do every day on their behalf. I have long admired the work that goes on in this room, both from my predecessors that have stood here to take your questions, and of all of you who do so much to explain the work that we do to the American public and to the world and to hold us accountable. And so my pledge to you will be that as long as I have the privilege of coming before you to take your questions every day, I will answer them as forthrightly as I can, share as much information with you as I possibly can, and that understanding that when I mess up, which I'm sure I will, you all will hold me to account. And with that, Matt, you want to kick us off? Yes, please. Uh, well. Before I uh, get into it, uh, let's see. Welcome aboard. Thank um, you. And uh, <clears throat> I'm sure you'll do just fine. Two words of advice. Don't use the word irregardless because it doesn't exist. And also, wholesome doesn't mean what you think it means. Uh, I, uh, I find right? myself in long standing agreement with you on both of those issues. Uh, <laughs> all right. So, anyway. Uh, and, and I reject the fact that the Oxford English Dictionary has changed the definition of fulsome, but I'm with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, uh, welcome. And uh, I'm sure we'll have uh, many fun times uh, here in this room. Um, let me start with uh, Israel and the Middle East. Uh, you put out a statement last night, or at least it was put out under your name, um, which was not particularly uh, <clears throat> enthusiastic. Well, let's say it wasn't enthusiastic at all. It was actually highly critical of uh, Israel's decision on the Homesh uh, settlement or outpost, as it were. Um, I'm wondering, um, one, have you heard anything in response from the Israelis to your uh, criticism? Uh, two, does your criticism still 
stand whether you have heard anything or not. And then secondly, the second paragraph of your statement referred to uh, the letters that had been exchanged between um, former Israeli Prime Minister Sharon and former U.S. President George Bush, W. Bush. Um, and you seem to be complaining, and this is the second time this has happened, not the first time under your name, but the second time it has happened, um, that you guys have, have complained uh, about this. And yet, it was in fact the Obama administration that said when it was in office uh, that it no longer recognized or no longer felt bound by the assurances that were given by both sides in, 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 in these. So why do you expect the Israelis to uphold this when you guys haven't for 12 years? So let me start by restating what we said in the statement before I get to your questions, and that is that we are deeply troubled by the Israeli government's recent order that allowed citizens to establish a permanent presence in the Homesh outpost in the northern West Bank, <coughs> which according to Israeli law was illegally built on private Palestinian land. Uh, as you referred to, Matt, as our statement said last night, that order, this order is inconsistent with both former Prime Minister Sharon's written commitment to the Bush administration in 2004 and significantly the current Israeli government's commitments to the Biden administration. With respect to your question about uh, communications with the uh, Israeli government, of course we engage with our Israeli counterparts on a number of levels uh, uh, all the time. I'm not going to get into um, uh, speaking specifically about the contents of those uh, communications. And I will say with respect to the letters, our view has been clear and consistent that the expansion of settlements undermines the geographic viability <coughs> of a two-state solution. It exacerbates tensions. It further harms trust between the p two parties. And that is consistent with the views of pri previous administrations, both Democratic and Republican, including the views expressed in that exchange of letters. But, you know, I, I don't care who, who the letters were exchanged between. They could have been between Golda Meir and, you know, Lyndon Johnson. But the fact of the matter is, is that you guys were the ones who first said you are no longer bound by them. So why do you I, keep I, bringing that? Why, why do, you know, if you think that what the Israelis are doing now is inconsistent with what they've told you, I mean, you meaning this administration, that's one thing. But why keep bringing up the Sharon Bush letters? Because I don't agree that our position has changed over time. Our, our position has been clear and consistent across administrations, and it is our view that that letter was not really? withdrawn. It, that is, it, our, the last our view, administration, that, really? Our view that, is that, that, that was a clear and consistent view in our, the last, during the last administration? Uh, it is our view that the letter to which you referred has not been withdrawn, and that the Israeli government and okay. that the Israeli government has not withdrawn the obligations it made in its letter. Okay. All right. Well, the, the, then, that, then that's interesting. So. This administration still feels bound by the, uh, the the commitments that President George W. Bush made we, to former Prime Minister Ariel Sharon. Our our, back poli in our policy has not changed, and that is that the expansion uh, of settlements. I'm not asking is, you, do you, do you, the letter are, has not been withdrawn, and our policy has not changed. Well, then what what did the Obama administration do? I'm, I, maybe I'm I not a spokesperson for the that, Obama administration. I'm not going to no, speak. But I'm not going to speak that. I'm going to well, speak to what know, our the policy current is. president was the vice president during the Obama administration. So I just cur I, I, I'm just I'm curious. Do you expect the Israelis to uphold something that 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 the Obama administration already? said it was not interested So in uh, what I will say is we expect them to withhold to uphold their commitments that they made in that letter their commitments that they made to the Biden administration and as I said uh, the fact that these settlements are yeah. illegal under current Israeli law Okay well I, I I could understand this a lot better if you said if you just <coughs> said that you expect them to uphold their commitments to the Biden administration but Which the I fact said. of the matter is that you're ask, asking them to uphold commitments that were made, you know, almost 20 years ago, you know, 15 years ago, uh, that you, that the United States, under the Obama administration, has already said they, they're not bound by. So why does Israel have to uphold them if you don't? And, and just, so, uh, just again, drop no, it again, the, again, know, again, 
We have not withdrawn that letter. We do not believe that they have withdrawn their obligations under the letter. But more to the point, this, these settlements would be inconsistent with current Israeli law and, as I said, consistent with the commitments that they made to this administration in the last few years. Um, okay. Uh, so just the way I get one more, it will be really brief. On um, uh, on Homesh, and, the, and, and uh, so the Israelis say that they are not going to rebuild anything on private po Palestinian uh, land. Uh, is that okay with you, or is it is that just a non-start? I, I would say, as we have said, we believe the expansion of settlements um, uh, <clears throat> undermines the geographic viability of the two-state solution, as I've stated, in including and, and their in, pledge in, was to remove all settlements from this area. Can I follow up on that? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Andrew. Uh, the, can we focus on the second paragraph as well? Because clearly, <laughs> Jerome did not observe any uh, uh, any understanding about not going to the, the Temple Mount. Um, is there an understanding, a legal understanding, um, other than your concern, the U.S. concern about that holy area, about what you're saying was the provocative visit? Uh, I will just reiterate that we are deeply concerned by the provocative visit to Haram el-Sharif, Temple Mount. Um, we believe this holy space should not be used for political purposes, and we call on all parties to respect its sanctity. And more broadly, we reaffirm the longstanding U.S. position in support of the historic status quo at Jerusalem, Jerusalem's holy sites and underline Jordan's special role as the custodian of Muslim holy sites in Jerusalem. Does that, did that apply when Israeli police entered the, the mosque uh, just in recent weeks? I will say, um, not, not speaking with respect to that specific incident, incident but that um, we are concerned by any actions uh, by either side that escalate tensions and make uh, an and ultimate resolution more difficult. Aside from your statement, at what level has this been communicated? To the Israeli government? Uh, as I said to Matt's first question, we regularly communicate with the Israeli government at a number of levels, but I think it's more productive for us to keep those conversations confidential. Matt, Matt. Can I just a yeah. Thank you. Good to see you behind the podium. Thank you. And irregardless of what, uh, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> you're going to get yourself ejected from the room, not by okay. me. All right. Uh, uh, I mean, look, uh, good statement, strong statement as far as you know, stating your position. Uh, on the settlements and so on, and expansion uh, and otherwise. But what next? I mean, you know, I, regardless of the, the letters, the exchange and so on. So we've heard from behind this podium by you, by the secretary, by others, and, and so on, uh, expressions of displeasure, concern, and all these things. But what steps are you willing to take? I mean, you know, the, <coughs> it can be concerned, deeply concerned. It can be, you know, maybe you're angry and so on. But what steps can you take to really drive the point home. So I'm going to, first of all, um, somewhat disagree with the implicit uh, premise of your question that the words that we deliver from this podium or elsewhere in the U.S. government have no impact. I think if that weren't true, I wouldn't be looking out at a full room of people here um, uh, ready to ask uh, what our position is on this issue and others. Um, what I, what, uh, that's, yeah, no, I, I, I think that's one thing I, I definitely don't. Um, uh, what I'll say, Said, is that we will continue to make our views known, uh, or will make our views known publicly, as we did in the statement last night, as I am here, and we will continue to make our, our views known privately. Well, are, are we ever going to hear or else kind of a thing? You do this or else, this is our position. And you know, just before you answer that, let me ask you about my own village. I mean, you know, there are plans uh, today to, to build in my own village, in Abu Dis, you know, 400 housing units. So, I mean, it's, it seems that the Israelis, you know, they, they may uh, take what you say very seriously, but then they go on with their own plans. Uh, I, I will say, with respect to those reports, we have made abundantly clear on a number of occasions that the Biden administration, like most before it, views the expansion of settlements as counterproductive uh, and an obstacle to peace that undermines the geographic viability of a two-state solution. And, Said, we will continue to make that view clear, both publicly and privately, um, uh, to governments in the region. You know, building 400 housing units in the heart of that town, it will make like Hebron. It will be a flashpoint, it will be, you know, co constant confrontations and so on. I mean, would, would you, would you, dis how would you dissuade them from doing such a thing? Uh, I, I will, we will continue to make, we will continue to make our views known as I have just done. Thank you.
Okay, I'm there. Hi, Matt. Welcome. Um, and good luck with your new gig. Thank you. Uh, so I just want to move to China. Um, a lot of things happened over the weekend, and President Biden said a shift in ties could occur shortly. We've seen Chinese MFA come out and respond to that. Um, I don't want you to read President Biden's mind, but then I am curious if his comments were a reference to Secretary Blinken possibly rescheduling the Beijing trip. When can that happen? And after this weekend, do you see it more likely to happen soon rather than sooner rather than later? So I don't have any announcements, as you probably anticipated, I would say. Don't have any announcements about uh, rescheduling that trip or, or other further travel. Um, uh, I think what I would say is that, as you know, uh, the National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan met with Wang Yi. I think it was week before last now, and uh, this was one of the things that they discussed, the way in which the U.S. government will continue to engage with China. We've made clear that we think it's important that we engage with China about issues of shared concern and about issues where we have concerns about uh, actions by the PRC. So. We continue to work through with our colleagues at the White House and with our colleagues uh, at other brand agencies in the U.S. government the timing of any engagements with China, who would make, uh, who would be responsible for those engagements, where they would occur, when they would happen. But I don't, as I said, to start have any, any announcements right. to make so today. Right. Your answer actually kind of answers my second question because we also know that other officials might be traveling too. There's talk of Secretary Yellen, Kerry, Raimondo. You said that there are talks across the government. So. Uh, would you still say it's more likely for Secretary Blinken to go first, or it might be another high-level cabinet-level official going? I, I wouldn't want to speculate at all about the timing or sequencing other of events. Secretary Blinken has made clear that he looks forward to um, rescheduling that visit when conditions allow, but I don't have any announcements okay. to make about and when it'll happen. And I have something specific on the Marshall Islands. So. Um, I just want you guys to clarify when you expect to finalize a new COFA agreement with the Marshall Islands because um, Zhou Yun was just there for three days. You guys have been negotiated, negotiating this for more than a year and he told Reuters on Saturday that he hoped to finalize a deal uh, in, within the coming weeks. But then Secretary Blinken said, told the Pacific Islands Forum today, U.S. is looking forward to entering negotiations with the Marshall Islands. Did he miss? or can you explain? What no, we continue to, to work on that matter. It's a high priority for us, but I don't have uh, any further details to offer about when such uh, negotiations could be concluded. Do you think the fact that it wasn't signed on this one was some sort of a setback or? No, not at all. It's a priority for us. As you know, we finalized uh, other similar agreements in the region. We're continuing to work to this one uh, and, and look to finalize it in short order. Sure. Um, oh, we actually, what? before we do anything else on China, before we, China? yeah. Thank you. Welcome to the podium. Thank um, you. Um, <laughs> well, she started in China, so some forbearance, Matt. <laughs> Is the State Department consi considering whether to lift sanctions on Chinese Minister of National De Defense Li Shangfu? Uh, no, we are not. Um, uh, uh, does we, well, I'll leave it at that. No, we are not. President <laughs> Biden said during the press conference in Japan that it's under negotiation. So are you saying that the President Biden have different? Uh, very, uh, I very much not so. Uh, he also <laughs> made clear that we are not uh, planning to lift any sanctions uh, on him or on China more broadly. But I, I, is the U.S. entertaining the idea or whether or not to lift sanctions to for negotiation purpose. No. Yeah, before before anything else on China, and then I'll, I'll, I'll come back. I'll come to you as soon as time. Go ahead. Yeah. So there was a Taiwan Science and Technology Cooperation Dialogue today earlier, and uh, I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about how this fits within the wider framework of um, keeping Taiwan included in the Asia-Pacific commerce, body of commerce and um, development, and, uh, and beyond that, uh, within the global commerce and development area. Um, let me take that one back and get you an answer. Okay, thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, welcome to the podium. Uh, Nadia Arabiya. Um, Iran just announced the appointment of a, a new ambassador to Saudi Arabia, Rida Anayati. 
Um, do you support this and do you see it as uh, a way to de-escalate within the new frame of agreement that was signed between the Saudis and the Iranians <coughs> recently? I don't have any comment on the appointment uh, uh, of a new ambassador. That's an issue uh, between uh, Iran and Saudi Arabia. As we, I think, believe we've said before, we welcomed we welcome continued diplomatic uh, engagement in the region. Uh, but I, uh, and if any such diplomatic uh, engagements could lead Iran to curtail its malign activities in the region, we would, of course, support that. But I don't have any comment on that specific announcement. But some people were doubtful that the agreement actually can be implemented but the fact that now they have uh, appointed an ambassador. Um, initially, the administration said they, they did support the agreement. I'm just wondering if you see practically if this is step actually will lead to more stability in the region, or do you still that Iran, you hold Iran accountable for everything else that's been doing in the uh, region? I, I think two things can be true. Number one, they appointed an ambassador, and number two, we very much continue to hold responsible, uh, Iran responsible for its activities in the region. Do yeah. Uh, do you have any comments on uh, the uh, uh, on the Arab League uh, summit uh, final uh, statement in general? Um, I will just say, as we have said before, we continue to oppose normalization with the Syrian regime. We do not believe it was appropriate to uh, admit Syri readmit Syria into the Arab League, and we made that position clear to our partners in the region. That said, uh, if those countries are to continue to engage or to resume engagement with Syria, we think it's important that they demand progress on a number of areas where we have concerns with Syria's behavior and where we understand they have concerns with Syria's behavior. That would, of course, be the trafficking of Captagon, uh, humanitarian issues in the region. And so while we oppose any normalization with the Assad regime, we do hope and expect that our partners in the region will press for progress on the many issues on which we have shared concerns. And the one more, any comments on Hezbollah war games yesterday in South Lebanon? So we have seen these reports. Uh, we reiterate, reiterate our position that Hezbollah remains a designated foreign terrorist organization and a specifically designated global terrorist. Uh, Hezbollah is more concerned with its own interests and those of its patron Iran than what is best for the Lebanese people. And I just want to note something that, that the Prime Minister of Lebanon said, which is the event constituted a diminution of Lebanon's authority and sovereignty, and add that, moreover, it threatens Lebanon's security and stability. Thank you. Yeah, Alex. Thank you. Tough question to the weeks and months ahead. But sure. this is your first day. I have a very simple question. Give what's going on in Ukraine. Simplest it's questions are sometimes the hardest ones, so. Let's, let's try it out. 16 months we are entering into Russian consistent attacks. Today, Ukrainians woke up again, apartments damaged. Is Russia a terrorist state? Uh, so we have not designated Russia uh, as a state sponsor of terrorism. <clears throat> as I think you're aware, we've spoken to this before. We don't believe that that's the most effective mechanism for holding Russia accountable and that, in fact, doing so could have counterproductive uh, or could have counterproductive side effects in our ability to deliver humanitarian aid to the region. But what I will say is we have continued to hold Russia account to account through a number of other reasons, re, uh, 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 another, another a number of other steps. Those started even before Russia invaded uh, Ukraine with our d delivery of weapons to Ukraine. It's continued with the sanctions and export controls that we have imposed and that our allies and partners have imposed on Russia. And I think most significantly, it's continued with the weapon systems that we have delivered to Ukraine. And as I said in my opening remarks, further weapon systems that we announced even in the last few days. So. We will continue to, to look at all the ways that we can hold Russia accountable for its actions. But most significant of those is co to continue to back our Ukrainian partners so they can repel the Russian forces that have invaded their country. And the reason why I'm asking is that because given the familiar pattern that we have seen in terms of weapons, you know, you guys have first you say no, and then you can reconsider your decision. I was wondering if you are still reconsidering your decision on uh, designating Russia as. Uh, no, we have no. we have said. Look, we uh, we do always look at every tool that's in our toolbox, but we do not think that it is the most effective way to hold Russia accountable at this time. It uh, does not necessarily or significantly add to the mechanisms we have already taken. And I think you have to look at the me the the measures that we have imposed, which have had a serious impact on the Russian economy, which have had a serious impact on Russian oil revenue, which of course helps fund the war machine. And so uh, while there, we will always look at 
what other measures are appropriate to impose on Russia, uh, I'm not going to make any apologies for the measures that we've opposed, uh, we have imposed to date. And let me give you a sense of what's going on in Belgorod. Uh, what's the limit of number of questions from one reporter before you move on? I'm new here, so. I, I promise my last one. This. In Belgorod, what's going on there? So what's your sense of? What's going on where? In, in, in Belgorod. Uh, in Belgorod. Uh, the border, uh, Russian, uh, Ukrainian border, which is Russia side of the uh, town. I, I, uh, do I you have any sense of what's going on and yeah, its implications? I don't have any updates on, on um, uh, activities on the ground. I would refer you to the Pentagon for any updates or, of course, the Ukrainian government. Can I follow up on that one? Yeah. Um, so in, in Belgrade, there were, there are obviously these reports, and there's images online that suggest American weapons have been used. Um, so I know you don't know, but do you support U.S. weapons being used on Russian territory? And, w and would that change the calculus of uh, providing F-16s to Ukraine? So uh, with respect to the calculus of providing F-16s to Ukraine, the president has made very clear that we will begin training U the Ukrainian military uh, to pilot F-16s, and we will work with our allies and partners on the provision of F-16s to Ukraine. I don't have any announcements about when or, or how that will happen or what countries they'll come from, but it is a priority for us, and we will begin to implement that in the coming months. And then with respect to the broader policy question, we have made very clear to the Ukrainians that we don't um, uh, enable or encourage attacks outside Ukrainians' borders, but I do think it's important to take a step back and remind everyone and remind the world that, of course, it is Russia that launched this war. It's Russia that continues to launch attacks on civilians in Ukraine. It's Russia that's targeted schools and hospitals and civilian infrastructure. So it is up to Ukraine to decide how they want to conduct their military operations, but it is Russia that has been the aggressor in this war. Yeah, Jenny. Thanks for that. Welcome to the podium. Thank you. Do you have any updates on the efforts to free Paul Whelan or Evan Gershkovich? Um, has Russia engaged at all with the proposal that Secretary Blinken mentioned a couple months ago? So uh, I don't have any specific updates with regard to the proposal that we made. Uh, as you know, as we've spoken to before, we <laughs> oftentimes have found that it is not conducive to our efforts to return wrongful detainees home to speak about the details of those efforts. So we tend to, to for the most part, keep them confidential. I will say that uh, I did see Paul Whelan's comments in the interview uh, that was released over the weekend, and, and I can assure him and I can assure his family member that we have no higher priority than returning him safely home to the United States. And the secretary continues to work on it, other people in, in this building, other people in, throughout our government uh, continue to engage on it. And the same goes, uh, the same holds true for Evan Gershkovich. As we announced on Friday, the Russians again denied a consular visit for Evan. It was the second time that they've refused to fulfill their obligations. We will continue to press them to fulfill those obligations as they uh, are supposed to do under consular conventions. And at the same time, we will continue to work to return both Evan and Paul to the United what States. What sort of engagements have you had with the Russians on that front? Are there plans to summon Antonov, for example, over the fact that they keep denying consular access to Evan? You know, uh, S uh, Secretary Blinken had a call with Sergei Lavrov some time ago that we made known publicly. And beyond that, for the reasons I outlined a minute ago, we'll keep the, the communications confidential. Will he call again? Uh, I'm, I, I don't have any announcements to make. And for the most part, as I've said, usually, we found that it's counterproductive in such a delicate situation as returning wrongfully detained, detained Americans home to make public all of the work that we're doing to secure their release. Yeah, go back. Yeah, and do you have any update? And, and uh, are you, do you have any reason to believe that the parties will uphold uh, this uh, ceasefire, which is supposed to enter into force very shortly or? A few hours, already. yeah, a few yeah. hours. Um, is, yeah, do you have any reason to believe that the parties will uphold this ceasefire since they haven't uh, upheld any other ceasefire? And could you tell us a little bit more on this monitoring mechanism and who exactly is going to be monitoring uh, and if that has been set up definitively ahead of this uh, ceasefire which is supposed to come into force? Let, so, let so. me make a few comments about this in response to your question. Um, <clears throat> Number one, we believe this was an important agreement that for the first time was signed by the two parties. It will allow the delivery and distribution of humanitarian assistance. It will allow the restoration of essential services. The two parties are supposed to withdraw their forces from hospitals and essential public facilities. These are all important steps for the Sudanese people. And I will say in response to your question, uh, your first question about 
prospects for it, one of the things that is included in this ceasefire agreement that we think is, is important is this international monitoring mechanism. And I, I'm not going to get into all of the details of that other than to say that from our part, Ambassador Godfrey will lead, uh, will remain in Jeddah and lead the U.S. delegation that's in, in charge with monitoring and implementing this agreement. Okay, and, and that mechanism has been set up already, or I mean, it's set up, we know who's in it? Uh, Ambassador Godfrey will lead the U.S. For, for the U.S. Uh, for, for the, yeah, for the U.S. The I don't have any, for, any further details to make public at this time. I, other than Ambassador Godfrey leading, I don't have any other specifics. Yeah. Um, welcome to the podium. Thank you. Thanks. Um, late last week, there were some reports that, that the Wagner Group has been trying to procure weapons uh, for its fighters in Ukraine by sourcing them from African countries, uh, specifically uh, Mali, and those would be going to, um, to their fighters in Ukraine. Do, do you have any confirmation of that or any sort of additional details? Yeah, what I'll say is we do believe that uh, Wagner is trying to obscure its efforts to acquire military equipment for use in Ukraine, including by working through third country, third party countries where it has a foothold. We have been informed that Wagner is seeking to transit material acquisitions to aid Russia's war through Mali and is willing to use false paperwork for these transactions. In fact, there are indications that Wagner has been attempting to purchase military systems from foreign suppliers and route these weapons through Mali as a third party. Uh, we have not seen as of yet that in, any indications that these acquisitions have been finalized or executed, but we are monitoring the situation closely. We have sanctioned a number of entities and individuals across multiple continents that support Wagner's military operations, and we will have more to share on this, uh, this question soon. Is there any sense that um, this might have been what happened in, in South Africa? I mean, there was a lot of confusion related to the ambassador's comments um, a few weeks ago now that there was shipments of weapons going out. He would bet his life on it. Um, the South African government obviously objected to that characterization, and, and there was some confusion as to where I think all of that ended up, and the South African government is looking into it. Is there a sense that it might not have been South Africa that was shipping weapons, but that possibly uh, a third party group like like Wagner or uh, you know, another mercenary group was, was trying to use that port or ship weapons out that were not an official sort of South African weapons shipment? I don't think I have anything to add other than what we said uh, several weeks ago, which is we were concerned about that incident in South Africa, but uh, I don't have any other any further details well, to share. Can you just say, Matt, how recent are those, those events that you just read on, uh, on Mali? Uh, uh, did that just... Is that from like a couple of days ago, or is it from December? And it's it's new. This is a new a new new, a new from, matter. New from a new concern from the United yes, States. No, um, the broad concern is not new. These are specific well, well, new specific uh, no, details. No, no, no. I, I, I get that. But, but but with that language and and <clears throat> the specific uh, allegation that uh, they might be trying to get stuff from Mali, how new? Like a day? The last several days. days. The, I think days. I think we made it public and under some form of fashion. It was reported over the weekend and. Confirming it here. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Congratulations on the new role and the best of luck for the briefings. Um, Earlier this morning in Manhattan, New York, there was an attack against the Turkish diplomatic mission just across the street from the United Nations as well. Um, I think the suspect is still at large. Um, what do you have to comment as the State Department against this, you know, about this attack against the diplomatic mission? Sure. We have seen these reports of vandalism at the Turkish House in New York City. Uh, I can tell you the State Department's Diplomatic Security Service, Service is working with local law enforcement authorities on the investigation. We condemn the vand vandalism. Uh, violence against diplomatic crimes is in, within the United States is a punishable crime. And for additional details, I'd refer you to the a, NYPD. A tiny follow-up on that. Um, there's obviously a long-running history of uh, attacks against Turkish diplomats and diplomatic missions. Even, even in Los Angeles, we had a diplomat that was killed. Uh, by the Asala Armenian terrorist group. So have you been able to find out if there's been any plans or plots prior to this attack, any threats against Turkish diplomatic missions on U.S. soil? I don't have any other further, any further details to add. Obviously, it's a matter that uh, remains ongoing, and I think, as will often be the case about investigative matters, I would leave comment to law enforcement, in this case, the NYPD. Thank you. Thank you. Um, oh, welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I would like to ask on the G7 summit in Hiroshima. Uh, Ukrainian President Zelensky joined the summit uh, by arriving at Hiroshima uh, on the French government airplane. 
I know uh, its operation was basically arranged by French and Japanese government, but I'm wondering if the uh, United States uh, provided any diplomatic or uh, security support uh, regarding this Zelensky trip. I'm not aware of any. Uh, I would refer you to the, the French government and the Japanese government for, for further details, especially since he traveled on a, a French government plane. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you, um, and welcome to the podium. I wanted to ask you about Bakhmut. The fog of war there has been uh, making it very about difficult. Where? I'm sorry? Bakhmut in Ukraine. So the fog of war there has been very difficult to understand who is in control of the city. I was wondering if you could shed any light on whether the U.S. assesses that Russia or Ukraine is currently in control. Have you been in communication with your Ukrainian counterparts on the city? And does the U.S. address the situation there? We do know that there are very few Ukrainian troops. Does the U.S. assess that that is a setback or perhaps part of a broader strategy? So uh, again, uh, we remain in constant contact with our Ukrainian partners uh, really at several at several different levels of the government, from the State Department, from the White House, obviously from, from the, the Pentagon. And for any comment about the military situation on the ground, I think it's more appro appropriate that it comes from the Pentagon or from Ukraine themselves. Uh, <clears throat> I would just note that whatever the exact situation uh, in Bakhmut, as the President noted, um, uh, over the weekend, the Russian military and and uh, private uh, military corporation Wagner Group collectively suffered around 100,000 casualties in its assault. And uh, in their attack on Bakhmut, we've all seen the pictures, destroyed the city. And so, of course, we lament the loss of life there. But I don't have any specific comment on the situation on the ground. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, uh, welcome. And good luck, of course. Uh, sir, yesterday we had elections in Greece, I'm sure you know. Uh, the current prime minister, who is a pro-American, uh, emerged as the big uh, winner against the left. I wanted to know if you have any comment. Sure. Uh, first of all, I'll say w about our, our relationship with Greece. The U.S.-Greece bilateral relationship has strong support across political parties in both the United States and Greece. It has been strengthened. Uh, over years of cooperation between multiple administrations and governments in both countries. We congratulate the people of Greece on exercising their democratic right to vote in the birthplace of democracy. And for our part, we look forward to continuing to partner to deepen our partnership with Greece and work with any government that's chosen by the Greek people. Thank you. First, one, welcome to the podium. It's a tough. You'll have to stop saying that. It's you know. Well, every, it's a tough, every... tough room, but I I'm sure you will you will enjoy this experience. Uh, my question: um, the Senate hearing on the Western Balkans took place last week, and given that State Department officials Gabriel Escobar and Derek Chollet gave their testimonies, I have a few a follow-up question. So, Councilor Chollet said at the hearing that the U.S. wants to deepen relationship with Serbia, and at the same time, uh, Chairman Menendez opened the hearing on the Western Balkans with a text on the Serbian president, who is the actor in the ongoing high-stake high negotiations between Serbia and Kosovo. My question, do you find this approach constructive and aligned uh, to the U.S. diplomatic effort and what Secretary Blinken is trying to achieve uh, between Serbia and Kosovo? Um, that's my first question. And the second question, uh, Shalez said that Western Balkan is a top priority for Secretary Blinken and the Biden administration. He said, quote, for so many of us, this is personal. Uh, what does this personal mean exactly, if you can unpack this a little bit for us? Um, uh, let me take that question back and get you a, a more complete answer, given that you asked about uh, what uh, Councillor Shalez meant and other measures. I'll, I'll take that question back and get you a complete answer. And the first question about the uh, the attack uh, on the president in the middle of the negotiation while the U.S. is saying I'll they take, want I'll to I'll take that back as well. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Yes. Uh, let, me, let me get, you've had four or five, I'm not sure. Um, back the, I'll, I'll come back to you, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Summit was uh, going on uh, in Japan at the Hiroshima on the 19th. And on the other side, uh, there was a summit meeting with uh, five Central Asian countries led by China, which began on the 18th um, at the Xi'an, it's a uh, West China. How does the United States view Chinese independent uh, diplomacy? How does, chi how does the United uh, States how view? The United States view uh, Chinese uh, independent diplomacy. 
in defense diplomacy with yeah. respect to Ukraine? Uh, no, for um, uh, in China at the CN, uh, Chinese they did a uh, summit meeting on the 18 with uh, Central Asian countries. Oh, sure. Uh, <clears throat> I will say with respect to that, we have never asked uh, any country in the world to choose between the United States uh, and China. Uh, as you know, Secretary Blinken traveled to Centra Central Asia just several months ago uh, to talk about how we can deepen U.S. diplomatic and economic ties with the, the region. But uh, at the same time, we uh, expect and understand that countries will have diplomatic relations and, and discuss the concerns they and interests they share with China as well. Thank you. China? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, congratulations on your new position. Uh, so China announced yesterday that they banned uh, major Chinese firms from purchasing products of Micron technology, uh, saying that they found significant security risks. Do you have any reaction to it? Yeah, so number one, we're aware of the news. We saw those reports, obviously. We have very serious concerns uh, that with the reports that the PRC has restricted the sale of Micron chips to certain domestic in industries. The Department of Commerce is engaging directly with the PRC to make our view clear. And broadly, this action appears inconsistent with the PRC's assertions that it is open for business and committed to a transparent regulatory framework. And another quick one. Uh, there are uh, fake images of uh, explosion outside the Pentagon circulated around on the internet uh, from this morning, I think. So do you have any information on this you uh, can share with us? Uh, I don't. I'm happy to follow up after the briefing. Sorry, just on my uh, do you, do you, is there anything in your um, <clears throat> in your guidance there about uh, Huawei? No, I don't have any comment on no? Huawei. No, okay. I think so, I think, I mean, I think our concerns guys, about Huawei guys, are well known. If you guys ban or seek to ban a Chinese company from doing you know from conducting business uh, here or overseas, why shouldn't they be allowed to do the same thing? Uh, I will say that we have made clear that there are concerns that we have with. Huawei and the use of Huawei techno technology, that's a national yeah. security well, uh, concern. Uh, yeah, well, but, uh, the, but okay, but, but China is allowed to have national security the, concerns too. They aren't are, they? but as I said, they have, uh, made, clear, so they have made clear that they're open for business and said there would be a transparent regulatory framework. Well, you made clear that you're Hold on. open they, for business they too. They have said they would have a transparent <laughs> regulatory framework, something I think we have here that does not exist in China. Uh, okay, but still. I think the difference is the transparent regulatory framework. I just said the rule of law is quite clear in, in the United States. Okay, less but, so. But, but yeah. well, you know, I don't know. People are talking. You know, there are states in the U.S. that are banning TikTok, right? Not just I, from I, government I, phones, but from all kinds of phones. So I think I'm so. You, well, you may be on you know solid ground as it relates to the federal government, but. Um, and and uh, and Huawei, because, but still, why can't the Chinese ban or stop the Chinese uh, government? The, the Chinese uh, government. Why, why can't they? The Chinese I mean, government even can take, if they don't have a legitimate reason to. So why can't they? They can take every decision that they want to take, obviously. But we believe that it ought to be okay, taken so through a the, transparent regulatory framework. Okay, They've so said then, that's what they're going to do. We don't okay, believe they have in all right, this case. So what's the? Uh, all right. Okay. So what? What are you going to do about it? Uh, as I said, the Department of Commerce is direct uh, engaging okay. directly with the Chinese government. Alex, they, they, and then they, I think I'll, this will be the last question. They, I'll have to wrap up. They, 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 no, right, wait, wait. Because uh, I got one yeah. more. This is definitely the last question. All right, you and the you, you, and then we'll close with Matt. Yeah, but for, mine for whatever, not, for whatever mine has is, the mine is not going to be difficult. For whatever has broken front <laughs> while I'm at the podium that I have no idea about. Go ahead, Alex. What is George's house focus? A number of events happened since our last uh, press conference. Uh, first of all, uh, we found out that Lavrov's sanctioned daughter uh, showed up in Georgia. Uh, Russia Russian aircraft showed up in Tbilisi. Um, now Georgian aircraft is uh, poised to fly to Moscow. Where has the U.S. been these days? There's no, no reaction and no sanction. Um, so I will say with respect to um, Russian aircraft um, uh, and Georgia, many Western countries, including the United States, prohibit Russian aircraft from entering uh, airspace. Uh, we have been concerned uh, about direct flights between Russia and Georgia resuming. Uh, it, mean, it could mean that 
uh, companies at Georgia Air Georgian airports could be at risk for sanctions. We, the entire uh, Western community has distanced itself from this regime, and now is not the time to increase engagement with Russia. But they have a timetable for reaction, so uh, it has been happening already. Uh, I do yeah. not. I do not. Go ahead. So come to you next. Welcome to the podium. Thank you. Um, the Supreme Leader of the Islamic Republic of Iran on Saturday uh, met with the country's diplomats and ambassadors. He basically gave them guidance on uh, how to conduct their diplomacy. Uh, the short version of which is, number one, he said, don't beg don't conduct a quote-unquote begging type of diplomacy, even uh, if, you, if you don't mean it, make sure it doesn't sound like you're begging. Number two, stick to, your own, to our principles, the Islamic Republic's principles. And um, when it comes to heroic flexibility, which he had used before in terms of showing flexibility during negotiations, for example, with the P5 plus one about the nuclear program, he clarified here that he didn't mean that people uh, that the Iranian side give up their principles or what they believe in, but to work around anything that may um, come uh, in front of what they're trying to achieve. So, do you have any comments? And do you think, given these issues, it seems like they're toughening again? Um, and all the concerns that the U.S. has with Iran is continuing diplomacy with Iran possible, especially with uh, regard to the nuclear program. So I, I will just say, without co uh, commenting on detail on, on those reports, some of which I'm familiar with, some of which I'm not, that we continue to, it continues to be a first principle for this administration that Iran should not um, uh, the Iran not be allowed to obtain a nuclear weapon. We have always believed, we continue to believe that uh, diplomacy is the best way to reach that solution, uh, but we have seen uh, no progress in terms of actions from the Iranian, Iranian government in the region. Matt, you want to close yeah, this off? Yeah, no, I just, will be extremely brief because I think you'll only have a five-second answer for both. One, do you know anything about the U.S. Embassy in Cuba renting Cuban government EV cars that are made by China. I do not. Okay. As could I you, think could, you anticipate, as you could, seem to anticipate. Could you, yeah. Well, I just heard about it, so I, I didn't think you would have anything, but I wanted to get it out there on the record. Thank Can you. you could, could, could you, or maybe not you, someone look into this and find out if it's true and what the deal is? I mean, it might be completely innocent. And then the second thing is just, um, the whole email thing from last week, is that, that's been resolved, right? It has been resolved. That was uh, an unintentional glitch. I'm glad that I've had the chance to look into this before answering. My colleague Vedant uh, did yeah, not, so since it broke while he was at the podium. It was an unintentional, well, it was an unintentional glitch. Uh, it was an attempt, or I said, the, the, the um, uh, systems team here, the IT team, was looking at ways to allow users, if they want, to select their pronouns. And uh, uh, <coughs> to be displayed in their uh, in their email address, and it was certainly not the intention to choose them for okay. anyone. And so it has it, been resolved. So it was. Fixed. It has been resolved. It was. It was, it was fixed that day. It was fixed or, that day. It was fixed that day. Okay, and and then, but but then, you know, there was this notice that went around offering people, you know, psychological or you know, help if they were offended or upset by this. Do you know if anyone took, took, took the lump on that? I don't, but we always look to offer whatever resources are available to okay. State I'm Department employees. I'm not trying to make light of it. I'm just asking you if, if you know that anyone felt strongly enough about it that they went to. I know you felt strongly about it, but I, I, no, I don't. I, <laughs> I don't. I, I'm not trying to bait you, I promise. <laughs> I didn't feel that strong about it. But anyway, thank you. Thank you. What, yeah. There was apparent, apparently a license, an export license issued uh, more than a year ago to a Maryland-based company to export an electric car and a charger to the embassy, and that four were supposed to be sent. And for some reason, apparently, uh, Brian Nichols did not approve that. I will say I'm not aware of these reports, and I think I will make it a practice not to comment on things that broke while I was at this podium that I have not had a chance to look into. So. More, more tomorrow. Thank you all.